Welcome to, uh, well, we have a lot of special Magpie Circle podcasts, but this is certainly more special than most. An end of season review, if you like, and we're delighted uh, to be joined by the club's chief executive, Joe Palmer, uh, and director and uh, head of recruitment, Richard Montague, uh, who've very kindly agreed to give us a, a good hour of their time. And we can take a full uh, holistic approach to everything that's going uh, on and off the pitch uh, at the football club. Joe and Richard, thank you very much for taking the time out to have a chat with myself and Stel. No Thanks, Paul. Lovely, lovely to, to be on here and, and to, to speak with you on this, these issues. No, no, we, we appreciate it. You know, transparency is an important thing. And when people hear from the main men, um, it makes things a lot easier. Uh, football is an emotional game, as we know. And <laughs> And I'm sure we, we've been riding a bit of an emotional roller coaster this season, that's for sure. Um, I think I want to make it clear to everyone that's listening and watching this. Um, no subject is off limits today. Uh, Joe and Richard haven't put any caveats on this. Uh, anything and everything uh, is can be asked and is on the record. Uh, and Stell and I, hopefully, in the course of the next 60 minutes, will be able to delve into a lot of the subjects uh, that you've raised with us. It won't be a straightforward question and answer session as such. It will be an opportunity to understand a little bit more about Joe and Richard as people, as, as well as the roles that they fulfil at Knotts. Um, and kind of I wanted to start off because clearly um, I can seldom ever remember um, such support uh, for owners at a football club uh, over four years into since they took over. And I'm talking obviously about Alexander and Christoph Reitz. Um, and I kind of wanted to kick off um, to get the thoughts of Richard and Joe of what's it like working with the brothers? What are they like as people? How, how do you find it all? And if I may, um, I'd kick off with Richard. Because I guess you're, you're I hesitate because you look very young, Richard. Uh, a few more years and not you won't. Um, hey, that beard will be going grey. You're not a lifer with them, but you've, you've clocked up quite a few years with them. What are they like as people? Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I've worked with Chris and Alex since... 2011 i think since they moved to london um to to start football radar so i worked with them from that period on um and obviously helped them find the club and identify knots and then came on board when 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 they bought the club um what do they like to work for they are good bosses i think i should start by saying that you <laughs> watch these shows by the way so you've the got thing to say, isn't it? um yeah they're good bosses they are very very rational um they're intelligent they're smart um and probably the most important thing for supporters is that they're incredibly engaged so they are obsessed with Notts county and obsessed with winning with Notts county so i think they they have their that we obviously have our own approach towards what we're doing here and, and our own beliefs about how we want football clubs to to run and operate but that all comes from a place of wanting the club to win and wanting to be successful um so yeah they they're they're fantastic to work with um we chat multiple times daily um and ultimately they they love Notts County and that they feel incredibly committed to the club and incredibly committed to the community and and the people here as well so um yeah the last four years have been incredible really in terms of my working relationship with them um being able to do this thing together it's been it's been an amazing journey so far and, and we're loving it really and even even in a season like this which as you say has its huge ups and downs it's still incredibly rewarding to be able to to do something like this and it's a privilege to 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 work for such a storied and historic club and and be its custodians really so yeah it's it's uh yeah, it's been fantastic and long may it continue. Uh, Joe, um, extensive career in football and, and kind of, you know, from European giants like Shakhtar Donetsk um, through to a, a kind of a, um, a trust or a hybrid trust model at Wimbledon. W what are your impressions of working with the brothers and, and, and how do you find it? What, what, what sort of DNA, how are the brothers doing it differently? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I certainly learned over the years of working at, at different clubs and also you know, speaking to other colleagues at clubs around Europe, one of the most important things is governance. 
if you if you have the right governance the right ownership then then anything can be achieved you know as, as if governance becomes a barrier then you know achieving what you want to achieve on the pitch can be very difficult and one of the things that that really drew me here was was the brothers um i think their their vision the fact that they want to uh, implement a, a strategy and a process again very few football clubs actually have that they, they say they have strategies they don't um and so for me this is this is what it was all about because you can understand that if you have a process and you follow that process and you're not deviated by knee-jerk reactions or emotions or, or opinions very much focused you you can achieve and i think you know on the long term and that's what we've got to talk about it's it's the long-term vision and going back to what richard said you know the club is in in really safe hands um you know they are heavily invested and you know for me it's it's really exciting because you know good governance is also stepping back and actually letting people um uh, do what they do best and i think they they trust uh, certainly myself and richard and they give us the tools that we need to to do the job properly and that's again very rare you know they don't give us that sort of interference um and and that's what we need you know uh, i think all all the staff in the in the club you know love the environment that we have here um it's a very positive one um and you know we, we, we're looking forward to where we can continue to grow uh richard um th there's a great video after wembley with the two brothers in their suits uh models of decorum and professionalism and being <laughs> reserved and, and, and i know the guy my, i put it in the book michael rimmings <laughs> rimming jumps off this bus in a <laughs> bear hugs them and, and you can see i think uh, um do they ever lose the rag with you richard do they ever go oh what have you signed in for or, <laughs> or, or, or are they always like that they are I think one of their the best things about them is their ability to be level and consistent. So you know what you're going to get, I think. So if they've lost their rag with me, it's probably because they've deservedly lost their rag with me. And if they're happy with they me... They do lose their rag with you sometimes. In, in, in their own way, I would say. <laughs> 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 Which is maybe different to, to some other ways. But no, I mean, that's that's to say, like, I think, I think that that consistency of approach is 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 how they conduct their business in terms of how we look at transfers how we look at performance how we engage with each other i think it's very very consistent which makes them good to work for because you know you're not going to lurch from one extreme to the other um but yeah i mean a, a wembley final and a promotion win like that yeah i think even even chris and alex maybe let go a little bit over that weekend um, I think you've mentioned in some of your statements, uh, Joe, about legacy in mm. terms of what the brothers are looking to achieve here. I mean, I guess we live we live for short termism in football, don't we? Most of the time, or certainly fans do. Uh, result week to week. Um, without giving too much away, I mean, how 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 long term a project is this for the brothers? You know, you kind of get the impression with the mm. infrastructure and the money they're putting in. Yeah. This is this is potentially decades, not two years and sell up in the championship or whatever an exit strategy might be. Absolutely. They, they strongly, strongly believe in, in, in the process and the model. And that model is built on the long term. Now you, you mentioned in football, you know, it's short term. I'd say it's even, even shorter than that. I think it's immediate term. You know, it's, it's unlike any other business where, you know, things change. You can completely change your strategy and your outlook after three months and then do it again, three months later after that. And it's, that's the the craziness that is football sometimes um and we're absolutely trying to st stay away from that and that's you know that what that means is you might not see immediate results but it's a long-term process and, and and it's very much follows effectively how how betting the betting model works you know that is long term you will have losses you know you will have wins but it's about where you end up and at the end of that long term you know and that's what they see you know is that eventually you'll go up and down but you will you'll go, end up higher in the longer term but you, only if you follow a process that has value-based decision making so they're very much of that opinion but you need to invest in order to, to, to give you that foundation um, to achieve that so as you said all these investments that we're, we're making off the pitch it's all about supporting that long term not suddenly throwing as much cash in as we can to have a boost in, in one season is going we're going to take a considered approach and we will get there you know it might not take one season, it might take three seasons, it might take four, but you get there. That's the most important thing is that we do get there. 
we don't throw a load of money, put ourselves in huge debt, and then get relegated. You know, we're very confident that the model, taking the the, the approach and the model that we are, that won't happen. That's that's what we're looking at. Just to, um, just to piggyback on that a little bit as well. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can sort of add that I think if you think of the 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 path Chris and Alex have had before Notts County, this is very much the the sort of culmination of their work, their their life's work, mm -hmm. their careers. So in terms of their longer term aspirations, this feels like something that they were always going to do and therefore will always want to be doing rather than maybe somebody who's seen an opportunity to buy a football club and, and gotten into it that way. Yeah. This is something that they would always have wanted to do um, and, and felt like the sort of natural progression for them. So I think obviously you'd never say never, but I, I just don't see that naturally coming to an end. They won't get bored of owning a football club because this right. is their life's work. Mm. Yeah, Joe. They, Joe, they, sorry, they, they, they have just, a vision of where it can get to. Joe, can I just follow in from there? And just yeah. you, you said that, and, and Richard mentioned about the progress. Four years since they've come in, you know. First of all, where where do you think the brothers see, you know, the progress over the four years? We start started with them in the national league. We're now in obviously League Two, so there has been progress. We've had that wonderful day at Wembley, um, and also statements come out about saying the club is maintainable and comfortable to get to the championship level in terms of finance. I think, you know, just a couple of questions on that, really. Where do the brothers and, and yourselves see that progress over the four years that we've had? And, you know, the next stepping stones up to the championship, what do you see the pathway of that being like? Because, you, as you're right, football fans and the Knox fans, everybody wants everything today, yesterday, you know. <laughs> when... And we've had ridiculous, you know, forecasts before about five years we'll be in the Championship X, Y, Z with previous owners. How do they see that progression? How do we get there? That's what the, I think the fans yeah. really want to engage with. Absolutely. And I think I think that, you know, there are different ways you can get there, you know. And, you know, there is the model where you spend a huge sum of money, which might not always work. Um, and, and you try to get there more quickly. I think what if I asked you the question, where do you think the club could get to? You know, so what we have to look at is the natural order of football clubs. So in terms of size and all the you know demographics, the fan base, the commerciality of certain clubs, if you if, if everyone was run the same, you know, you'd be on a sort of a sliding scale, wouldn't you, of where, where clubs can, can get to. If everyone ran sustainably and within their means and self self-sufficiently, there would be an order, wouldn't they, of where those clubs line up effectively. So, you know, on that basis, you know, when we model things up. Yes, there's there's the opportunity to get in the championship, and I think absolutely that's you know it would be wrong to say that wouldn't wouldn't be a long term uh, aspiration. You know, we want to go as far as the model can take us, um, but in a self sustainable way. So uh, what we're not going to do is you know what you see in football is obviously smaller clubs that have a lot of money that they throw in um, in a non sustainable way, and yes, they can get promoted, but what you quite often see is they're not able to to maintain that and they drop back down again because they're riddled with debt what we're saying is when we get there we won't have the debt meaning we could decide to do there's, there's multiple choices at that point the, the owners could decide to put more money in we could call in for more investors put more money in there's or, or we can continue with the model you know we hope the model develops um, by that point that it, it can sustain itself you know uh, better than than any other club in that division so it's it's a very exciting it's very unique um it's not been done before obviously you know brighton and brentford have, have effectively taken that data model from the championship into the premier league but no one's taken it from you know the national league you know right through um so uh, but it's a it's a continually evolving model i think that's really important it's not a finished article it keeps learning it learns in every division that it, it gets into um and it will continue to do that and, and that's all about progress. So, yeah, the, the, the long term would be is, is that I think as a club, with all the metrics that we have, it's certainly a, a championship is, is a realistic opportunity for us. Yeah, the, the, the two key bits are if we can if we can increase the, the revenue of the club, then we'll be able to have bigger playing budgets. The bigger the playing budget we, we have, obviously, that gives you a better chance of succeeding. But then the other critical bit on top of that is we, we always want to outperform the playing budget yeah so that's like the the key metric that we look at is can we outperform our yeah. playing budget if we can do that consistently and you can keep growing the revenue then there's no reason you can't keep going higher and higher because you can right. sort of escape your natural 
your natural place in the rankings that sort yeah. of judge the first two. Um, yeah. So that's that's the idea is outperform. Oh, happy birthday, Paul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you just had some balloons go up the screen there. Sorry. Really? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I have no idea. Go you on. must really like that answer. <laughs> it's not my birthday. I've not pressed anything. I'm going to open my hands like this now. I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, that that's that's like yeah. the that's the, that's the key principle really is outperforming the playing budget. And clearly, last year we were able to do that extensively. Um, and I think that the, the crucial point to get across that I think maybe gets lost if you say things like outperform your playing budget is you can still outperform your playing budget if you have a top two or three budget for the division. So it doesn't just mean that we're always going to have a, a low playing budget and we want to outperform that. We want to have a really high playing budget delivered by the commercial revenue, but we still want to outperform that. We want to push that playing budget. So last year we probably were second or third playing budget in the National League, but we wildly outperformed that by getting 107 points and perhaps even deserving a few more. Um, so we still had a very strong budget, but we outperformed that playing budget. Now this season, we haven't outperformed our playing budget. Um, so therefore, we're not happy with with how this season has gone as a whole. Um, but as Joe says, that's, this is a long-term thing. We just want to consistently try and beat, that, beat our playing budget and outperform. We'll come back to sustainability investment a little bit later in the program. But if I can perhaps just bring it to uh, on the pitch, because I know a lot of our flock and all our fans have um, it's a broad church, so we say, in terms of views. Um, and I, I kind of just want to address uh, head coach Stuart Maynard, because there's been a lot of debate. Um, and I guess if you look in hard, cold, hard, cold results, uh, four wins, three draws, ten defeats, one home win in nine. If you extrapolated the points from those games, it would give you 40 points, 41 points next season, which would be relegation. Um, yet you came out very early. So at a time when um, Foster at Plymouth was, uh, was sacked for a similar set of results at Plymouth, um, Stuart's successor at Wealdstone had has already been removed from office. Um, how do you and, you and you came out with an interesting statement? And can you kind of elaborate on that, the thought processes and that you came out strong for Stuart before there was the turnaround uh, with the back to back wins? Um, clearly, Stuart is your man. Clearly, Stuart's going to be in charge first game of next season. Could you just kind of talk us through those thought process processes you had, Richard, in that statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it I think it comes down to how we how we try and look at performances, and obviously, um, you guys I think have spoken extensively on the on the show about results versus other. I'm a traditionalist. Yeah, no, 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 that's absolutely fine. <laughs> I'm a traditionalist as well. I like winning. It's winning's the most <laughs> winning is winning, winning. Yes. Winning is the most important thing. Of course it is. Um what the 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 foundation of Chris and Alex's business is built on this idea that and and this principle that maybe the league table isn't always the most indicative predictor of what will happen going forwards. So it's absolutely the reality and the truth of the current situation is we are where we are in the league table or the form table and everything you've said there about um, wins and losses is, of course, it's absolutely correct. But to try and predict what's going to happen next, we believe that there's a better way to predict what's going to happen next rather than just looking at results. We believe that if you look at expected goals, which is that that expression that people don't particularly like, but if you look at sophisticated expected goals models like the ones we have, um, Answered. Yeah, we believe that we can we can better predict what's going to happen in future. And, and Chris and Alex's business has been built off of that principle. So we do know that that works and we know that that's um, that's verifiable. Um, so from our perspective, that's how we try and look at what's been going on. We say over a period of time, are the performances getting better or are they getting worse or are they relatively stable? And what we saw was that the performances were in, in our mind and in our models were relatively stable from the point that Luke left, um, which is perhaps to say that at the start of the season, 
we believe that we probably rode our luck a little bit and we didn't put out any statements at that point saying <laughs> maybe we should have done saying we're very very lucky to be top of the league we really shouldn't be we're not playing very well um i think maybe we'd have been laughed out of town if we'd have done that but that was that was our belief internally that maybe we were riding our luck a little bit and that the performances actually hadn't been that strong and the results might start to drift which is which is what happened through sort of november december and we can debate the reasons why that is but we certainly felt that we hadn't been performing particularly well for a, for a long period of time so none of that's to say that we think the, the performances have been great it's just to say that we don't think there was any reason to think they'd got significantly worse um since stuart took charge um so to clarify richard nothing has changed you your board collective opinion that Stuart Maynard is the right guy to, and this has to be the aspiration for next season, yeah. uh, all 24 teams will be wanting it, yeah. to, to, to be targeting the playoffs with Stuart at the helm. Yeah, we, we don't see any reason why not at all. How much of a, um, a learning curve has it been for you and the brothers? What's it like, you know, personally, emotionally, when all of a sudden, in the eyes of the fans, the wheels come off for a bit. Uh, you obviously have a more analytical approach, but um, I think one of the key things you need in professional football is you need a thick skin, you know, because no matter what you do positively, it only needs a couple of weeks of bad results. People forget those things. What what what's, what were those few weeks like when we were really struggling for results after the after the departure of Luke? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really difficult, right? I think I, I feel that, I would say, just, just as much as everybody else and very, very keenly. And it's, um, it's I hate losing. Like, I think Joe will know very well that I, I don't react particularly well to losing and I'm a very animated watcher. Um, so that's why I go in the gantry, because I can pace around and boot things. Um, but no, I mean... I, it, I think the beauty of working for Chris and Alex and the beauty of the approach we have is that we we can try and look at things in the cold light of day and be a bit more rational about them after after the fact. Um, so we try and look at performances over a period of time and 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 assess where we are rather than overreacting to, to difficult situations because human beings are essentially irrational entities and we, we do yeah. things on impulses and, and we yeah. act emotionally and, and we with with the it's not to say we're we're not emotional we are emotional um me probably more so than chris and alex but we can we can still use rational framework to to make decisions so it's 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 having that human experience and watching the games and enjoying the results positive or negative but then how you analyze them is is a step detached from that and is trying to be more, more rational about how you look at performances after the game. Do, do you spend much time personally with Stuart? Yes. So I'm here um, every Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm up, a, up in the club, so I'm here right now. Um, I go to every game. So I'm uh, with them pre-match, post-match. Um, socializing as well with all with all of the the head coaches we've had have tried to build a personal relationship to make everything that we do a bit easier to make it to make it more of a, a partnership which is how i think it should be rather than um a diktat from from up high rather than something that's just passed on from the owners to the manager by a middleman i want it to be a relationship and a partnership as a person um I presume you've been trying to offer him as much support and counsel as you can, because it clearly is a big jump from a, a Wealdstone environment and a, a, and a part time setup to coming up to a league club of the stature and size of Notts County. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's where everybody else around the club is massively important as well to I think it's I, first of all, I think it's quite difficult for any new manager to come in mid season when there's when there's games being played left right and center and you're you've got injury issues and the previous results to deal with and training ground being waterlogged and days and and things like that rather than having a full preseason which is always how you'd rather do it but i think everyone around the club then 
then chips in and, and tries to help new people settle. And and everyone here has been fantastic, I think, with with Stuart and, and Craig and Matty who've come with him. Um, but yeah, that's that's a big part of my role is to try and I guess induct him and help him into mm. how we how we look at football. Um, but that's a big thing that we talk about with prospective head coaches when we interview them in the first place is this is how it operates here. This this is how we look at it. This is how we um, appraise performance. This is how we look at recruitment and, and try and make that very clear from the outset so that they know what they're coming into. And I guess this is very much, and I think Stel is itching to have a chat about recruitment in a moment, um, but, but I guess this is very much, Stuart, uh, Luke, um, Ian, would all be kind of round pegs for round holes in the sense that you have a model and you want someone to fit into that model. And, and it, I, I guess if you kind of look at the the three top teams in League Two this year, um, Dave Challoner, Phil Parkinson, Nigel Clough, all very talented. I think they'd all like manager uh, on their title rather than head coach. All would probably want to be largely responsible for recruitment and run the club uh, from a football side in in their own image. And I'm guessing they, they're not really ever going to be types of managers under your model that that's a pond you would be fishing in, correct? I think I think it's certainly I, I think this approach that we have is certainly more common even in the, the past four years. I think it's got become more common. Yeah. Um, so I think you could probably say that that football radar operates as Notts County's sporting director in in insofar as you, we have one. That, that's probably how the best way to describe the model we have here. So if you think yeah. if you look at those those sporting director head coach models, they're pretty common across the EFL nowadays. Yeah. And probably more more clubs than not have uh, having that kind of model but you're absolutely right um there there are different head coaches or managers within those setups that probably have a bit more of a say than they have here i think that's fair to say but the the, the important thing that i try and do in my role is to try and sit between the owners and and what the the model is is pushing us towards and the, the head coach or the manager we're not very fussy, fussy about the title by the way it's much more about the responsibilities rather than the title yeah. um but my job there therefore is to try and interpret that what the model is telling and what the owners are are saying and what the head coach or the manager is saying and act as the sort of conduit to finding the right players that are going to satisfy the model but satisfy the manager as well so that, that's very important we don't want players that a head coach or a manager isn't going to want to use or isn't going to want to play um so I think that's that's a massive part of what I'm doing is to try and is to try and act as that go between uh, and smooth that transition for for the players that are coming in. Stel? Yeah, well, I'd say I think that's the thing. We come around to this time of the year. Obviously, you know, there's going to be no playoffs and that's it. Season sort of sort of done. We know there's two games to go. And I think everybody from a fan's perspective is now looking at and again, I I advocated that statement being made and thought it was the right thing to do. And I, th and I think the proof has been there that, you know, we had the, the Stuart Maynard sort of few banners, if you like, where there was discontent and that's people's right to show that. Um, the statement comes out, obviously a couple of wins help. That's the, the biggest, you know, plaster for everything. Um, so, so that harmonizes the fan base. Now we're at this st stage of the season, where I'm sure Joe, particularly for, for all the off field budgetary sort of marketing side of things, you need to harness the fan base because they're they are number one front and center of putting money into the club so i think from that perspective everybody now is looking to the recruitment side of things for next season and i suppose first question is what has been learnt from this first season in the back in the afl after the fantastic season last season in the national league record-breaking season the first season promised so much first third of the season promised so much and as you rightly said probably overperforming or over overachieving in terms of performances to then okay sliding away falling off a cliff whatever you want to call it but what what has been learned so what's going to be done slightly differently evolved rather than you know throw it all out the window and start again well i think that the the, the crucial point is we just want to get better we want to be stronger um and that invariably means better players 
so we want to we want better players we're always trying to bring in better players for the right price so to, to best maximize the use of our playing budget um and we want to start next season stronger than we started this one i don't i don't want to to focus necessarily on specific areas but our our commitment and and everything that we're working towards at the moment is about how can we start that first day of a season with a stronger starting lineup with a stronger squad than than what we're finishing this season um and yeah we we've been we've been talking about this since september october really um since as i say the maybe the performances weren't quite as strong as we were expecting given that we were such a historically strong national league side um we've been talking about how we make the squad better and stronger and more suitable for league two since then so whilst i don't want to focus on specifics necessarily about what we'll be doing i think we just want supporters to know that our intention is to to go into next season far stronger than we finished this season yeah I, I, with stuart there now obviously it was luke williams at the start of last season last summer recruitment there with, with stuart Maynard. just for me and, and obviously for fans as well the process that goes through you pick players first and then stuart fits them into the system that he wants or is it system first and i'm thinking with positions like full backs as opposed to wing backs you know players that can play dual roles we've obviously got you know like i say i don't want to talk about individuals and fully understand that delicate time of the season for that but but what is the actual process richard in terms of you know you'll have these discussions i know it's never black and white it's never mm. you know dead straightforward but and you'll try and cover all bases but is there a, is there a process that you prefer a preferred method look this is my or stuart says this is my preferred formation system and then you go and find the players to fit the round pegs in round holes or is it more of a look we need to be able to play a three a back four a, you know rotational and then you go and just find the best players you can for the right money yeah i mean it's it it starts off i think you'd be happy to know it starts off with conversations with with stuart in this case or with luke previously um long long conversations about what we need what we all feel like we need and then it comes back to the the model providing us with lists of players that the model believes are suitable that are then scrutinized by myself by Stuart by Matty um by other coach other members of the coaching staff other members of the team to review and decide on players that are both suitable for the head coach but also suitable from the model and then the other the other critical piece that we are massively invested in is trying to establish what price you should pay for those players because without being too brazen about it everybody knows who the best players in the league are generally they're the ones who earn the most money and if you're if you're working with a a, a set budget that is strong for the level and will be strong for the level going forward but you do need to you need to maximize that budget don't you so you need to you need to get good value for the signings that you're making so another critical part is we have a list of targets we have what we think we can get them for we have what we think is excellent value and then we'll move on the targets that we think represent the most value that satisfy both the model and the head coach and that really is the process um joe leads on the, on the negotiations with the agent um i will liaise with the agents in the first instance we'll we'll present ourselves as best as possible that'll be myself and stuart um and other coaches when relevant we'll meet with players uh to find out about character and motivations and things like that and then we'll try and move on them but but it starts from myself Stuart and and Matty the assistant coming to an agreement about what we think the the squad needs um and then the model provides the 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 initial list of players the the the, the short list if you will um to work from yeah. I think no, no, elephants in the room time, Richard. Um, and we don't want to talk specifics in terms of individuals, but offensively, the recruitment has been absolutely brilliant. You know, people will talk about the number of goals the club scores, the attacking prowess, the flair, the skill levels of players, and, and, it, and it's a joy to watch. 
But I guess at the other end of the spectrum, you, we, we can't overlook the fact we've conceded 85 goals, which is now, sadly, by a little margin, the worst in the division. I'm not sure if it's the worst or second worst in the Football League. Um, uh, how or how would you go about trying to explain that uh, from your perspective? Because clearly that is a massive conundrum without giving too much away. The, yeah, yeah. You focus on, and, and this is me as a fan, right? And we're, no, we're no, 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 that's, that's absolutely... And so it's unfair, but this is my fan hat rather than someone that's worked in the game a long time. You kind of think we've got to win more first balls. We're, we're not good defending set pieces. We've had issues with goalkeepers in the sense we haven't had a regular number one. And even when we've brought other goalkeepers in, that, that they've kind of been number one, not number one. Um, and clearly defending has been an issue for, for a long period of time, a long period of time now. And again, as a fan, the impact that we brought in, shall we say, in January, which is a difficult transfer window, has probably not been great overall in terms of the numbers of goals conceded. I mean, how concerning is it to you in terms of um, conceding that many goals? Um, do you bring in new metrics for that? Or, or just, just talk us through that. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think everybody at the club is is embarrassed of that record i think it's fair to say like that that is not it's not our intention to be this crazy freewheeling team that scores 100 goals but concedes 70 that's that's not that's not how you draw it up at all um and i think the the interesting thing to consider is obviously the levels don't compare and and you, you are going up a division but we had comfortably the, I think it was the second best defensive record in the National League last year. I think second only to, to Boreham Wood. Um, so there was clearly clearly something that changed in that transition from the National League to League Two that, that has resulted in conceding far more goals. Um, I think from our perspective, we do, and, and this is again conversation with a lot of people because we're all trying to understand these same things. From our perspective, we do think that it's a holistic um it's a holistic problem like it, it stems all over the pitch um and there are different reasons for that and, and different combinations of uh starting 11s that maybe we've put out that that in some areas haven't helped us defend the top of the pitch well or haven't helped us um in some ways that are, are different to last year that we maybe can't exactly put our finger on but it's absolutely true that that needs to be a priority for us going forward is to have a a, a very good defensive record you, simply can't get promoted conceding the amount of goals we have like we, we absolutely recognize that and and i think yeah that that's just going to be a big part of our summer i think touching on touching on january it's it i guess we sign a we sign a striker who's done very well and Brilliant. Which, Brilliant. which maybe which maybe proves your point uh, <laughs> we, we, um and then we sign scott robertson who we're very happy with and, yeah. and has done very well and obviously we, we get lou on a lou Macari on a permanent deal again like a, a deal we're very happy with i think it's fair to say that it is a harder market and the reasons for that are, are much more about just the general status of players as you guys will well know in in, in january you've got far more players under contract um players aren't really thinking about moving unless there's an, an extreme scenario in the example of scott he was sort of largely frozen out under a new manager at fleetwood when he'd been playing a lot before so there was an opportunity there but it's harder to do permanent deals i would say um we we did miss out on a couple that we would have liked who we, who we thought would have made us stronger in in defensive areas as well um but that will happen always and i think that might just be a a symptom of a difficult market we're also not going to pay over the odds um we that's, that's not we're not going to tilt our strategy for value just to 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 make a signing in in an, in an important area like that um yeah it's, it's just to say that i think we are obviously aware and embarrassed of a defensive record and it's it's just a major priority for the summer of course it is um would you in any way shape or form and that giving too much away um refine metrics if you know what i mean because you know, yeah. you spoke about i think in the statement about um 
attaching a lot of emphasis on the data to quality of uh, openings created uh, and, and, and to those conceded. Uh, and again, look, as a fan, lots of fans say this, you know, how do you go about measuring data is one thing in recruitment. How do you go about measuring um, resilience, you know, ability to play under huge amounts of pressure, mental toughness, th those kind of attributes and characters that without wanting to hark back to Stockport last night, we're doing it the morning after. Um, some of those teams at the top end seem to have some of those kind of abilities that are pretty key as well. And, and, and I think physicality, I think that would be, you know, a lot of people say we love this, love that. Do we have enough physicality at League Two level? Yes, yeah, so I think those are two different things. So I think you can you can measure physicality in in data, um, and right. and what the models that we use are about um, how much players contribute to chances created or chances conceded. So if you think about that, physicality is a big part of that. If you're winning yep. first contact from a corner, as you reference in terms of set yep. pieces, that's physicality and that's contributing to a chance going up or down. So that is that is a piece of what we do in yep. terms of. In terms of resilience and character, not really. I would say that I think that has to that has to come from this human element that we've spoken about in terms of uh, character references, meeting players, uh, and right. trying to understand as much about the individual as you can. I, I want to get across that we're not just picking a number on a spreadsheet and saying that guy improves Notts County without adding additional pieces to that to that <laughs> information. I think it's interesting, though, you, you, we speak about character and resilience. It's a lot of the same squad, basically a huge number of the same squad that were 2-0 down in a playoff semi-final at home to Boreham yeah. Wood, like the season was completely over, scoring a 97th minute equaliser and then a 119th minute winner, repeat the same thing a week later at Wembley, being 2-1 down in extra time, having just come back. So clearly they were, I think we'd all agree they were resilient in those instances. Um it might just be that there has been a, a, a rate, a, a, a level of quality that's gone up mm -hmm. in this division that maybe has brought some of those things more, more to light or more to the fore. I, I would think that it's probably a combination of lots of different things. Um, that that is the the beauty of football is it's very hard to to put your finger on anything exactly and say that's what we would like or that's what we would need more of or less of. Um, but I, I, yeah, I want to make it clear that that is very important for us character and resilience and having leaders in the squad is very important to us and it's absolutely like a bonus if we're recruiting and even can be a criteria that we use we, we can go out and say to, to the owners and to the model that we want we want leaders we want we want uh players with high levels of character and use that as an input into our models um a model is basically just lots of information you're putting in and then giving you an output. And if one of the inputs is what's this player's character like, you, you can still include that. Richard, how, how much will you and, and everybody at the club look at the successful teams from this year and, and maybe previous years at League Two? So obviously Wrexham, Mansfield, Stockport from this year. How much will you look at... You know, external clubs, other clubs, you know, th their factors. How did they build their team? What players did they have, et cetera, et yep. cetera. And you go, right, that's maybe a route we need to to learn from, you know, and modify. Yeah, I think that's 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 a really good question. So I think. Um, I think what you, the, the difficulty is that the, the biggest predictor of how well you do is your playing budget. Right. So if, if you have very, very good players you're likely to finish towards the top of the league. So I think we need to, you need to distinguish between looking at the top teams and saying, we need all those top players that they've got, or saying, look, these are teams that are punching above their weight a little bit here. How are they doing that? Now, a team like Stockport, despite having a very strong budget, is an exceptionally strong League Two side. They're probably outperforming their playing budget in terms of how they look in our models and how they probably look in, in other models that are available. So I think they they are an interesting team to look at. So absolutely, we would we would we would try and assess what other teams are doing well, um, and and take pointers from that. But it would be much more about the teams that are overperforming relative to what they're spending, rather than just saying this is what Team X are are doing because they've come top. 
Um, that could just be because they have the most expensive players, which is a pretty good way to win. I, I guess it would, because I think it would be the same situation for us in the National League last year. Would teams have looked at Notts County and gone, that's how we have to play? Um, I don't know, but there doesn't seem to be too many people mimicking our style from, from last season. No, so I suppose you want to get Joe to, to bring some more money into the club so we can have all the most expensive players. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 <laughs> this is where Joe tells well, us about all the fantastic revenue streams he's opening up. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a balance with that, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> with it, you know, when you look at some of the uh, the spend, particularly some of those clubs have, uh, have had last year that you would have seen on, you know, their balance sheets from their financial accounts, it's, yeah, there's there's a, there's a lot of debt. But it's also to say that you can you can have you can have top players yeah. uh, for the level on salaries that maybe aren't towards the very top of the division. Like I don't think I'm speaking out of turn for saying that when no. we signed Maka from from Gateshead, he doesn't immediately become our top earner. And the same with Jody when he joins on on loan from from Oxford for the remainder of the season, then signs for two years. You can still have very 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 good players, very exciting players. Yeah without necessarily having to, to pay top dollar immediately. Um, and that's really, that's, that's, that's our whole idea is can we, can yeah. we find guys like that, that need an opportunity that you put them in the right structure and the right system suddenly look like world beaters. What, one final question, Richard, then you can have a, have a sip of coffee, and have a lie down. <laughs> after the <minute. laughs> um, we, We've talked about players coming in. Um, clearly we have some very, very talented players. Uh, and I think it would be no secret uh, those players clearly would be coveted by other clubs, um, but they are under contract with us. Um, are there what sort of comfort can you give to Knotts fans? Uh, you know, you spoke about fielding the very, very strongest uh, uh, and in, you know, even stronger team at the start of the season. For most people, to be a stronger team unless you're going to really exceptional recruitment again. Um, I'm talking people like Macaulay Langstaff, uh, Jody Jones, League Two Player of the Year. Um, can you give any comfort to Notts fans that that, that that we're not going to be seeing outgoings in the summer with, with some of these key players? Well, I think that the, the really positive thing from our perspective is is that both those players are under contract, um, which actually reference is, is massive for us. They're both tremendous players who've given a huge amount to us already in the case of Macca over two seasons and, and 18 months for Jody. Um, our approach really is we don't, we, we don't want to lose anybody, but the way we, the way we'll always look at it is, as I say, if you come from that starting principle of, we want to put the best possible team out, we want to get stronger every year. There is of course a world where if somebody offers you silly money for a player and I'm talking Stal, if I offered you 20 million for Maka now, we'd probably all take it, wouldn't we? We'd say, we love you, Maka, and, and go off, enjoy yourself. Um, but we're 20 million quid richer, and that money then goes to produce an even better football team for the fans of Notts County than everybody's won. But obviously, that's not us saying that we want to we want to move players on or anything like that. Like, I think if you've got players like Jody and Maka, you want them in your team. Of course you do. But it's just to say there is there is always a world where you can get stronger and you can you can find the next wave of players by having a bigger playing budget if people want to pay very good money for your players but rest assured if anybody wants to take any of our players they will have to pay damn good money for it because the way we look at value at the football club is is in terms of how we best put the best possible team out for Notts County in in any given week and that certainly isn't by getting shortchanged or or pushing players out the door and not wanting players with us. Um, if anybody wants to come take any of our players, they're welcome to make offers for them all, but they're going to have to be big offers. Yeah, I think I think it's fair to say, Richard, then on that that they're, they're not up for sale specifically. But Absolutely you not. found Jody Jones, you found Macaulay Langstaff, the value for money model that that you are talking about. Basically, found them two players. There's no reason they will not find more players yeah. to complement them right. or to replace them whichever the situation may be yeah absolutely uh, that, that's what it's always got to be built on because players will always move on yeah. um but but if you can find the next ones i mean the, the club is in a stronger position afterwards then then everybody wins really 
Um, but as I say, that's not and selfishly as well. I I just want them to stay forever. Of course I do. I think you've answered that very well, Richard. Uh, right now, then we've got a lot to get in with Joe. Um, have a lie down, Richard. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. stuff, so I'm going to log off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Stay in. Stay in. There's bound to be find, we've finding got. some party yeah. balloons on his screen. <laughs> yeah. You have to investigate this. I, I didn't see him, but anyway, it's not my birthday. All right. Um, Joe. So yeah. you come into the club. Um, what have you made of it all? What, what, what's, what, what, what's been the key learnings for you? Um, just, you know, give us an overview. Because you've been busy, I know that, and a lot yeah. of the things you're starting to announce now, and there are a lot more, and we'll be discussing one or two other possibles very shortly. I mean, what, what's it been like for you? Well, I think first and foremost, you know, it was, it was the potential. That was absolutely clear to see. You know, and in some cases, my, my eyes were bulging. You know, it was it was very much this, you know, commercially, um, uh, we were sort of very, uh, you know, undervalued in that sense. I think there was huge opportunities to, to, to boost the income. Um, and, um, you know, I think having, you know, the owners we've got, they, they gave me the opportunity to, to present ideas, business, you know, new business concepts to them, investment proposals. Um, and they they believed in they they understood they saw the, the long term value in those things and um, that's just been a, an incredible situation to be in to have been able to move forward with so many things in the first year and that really has been the, the process this year has all been been about kind of restructuring everything you know build, rebuilding that platform that enables next year to be strong and then the year after that to be you know even stronger um, so that we can then you know get to a, a place of, of self-sufficiency and sustainability um one of the big announcements has been uh the nest uh excellent mm -hmm. idea um i mean how how big a game changer for you is that going to be in terms of generating incremental revenue uh, for the club it's it, it's huge you know for me that was one of the most exciting things i, I came across it within the first week of being here and uh, I called called the brothers immediately and said, right, we, we have to get hold of this. Um, you know, it's one of the golden rules in, in football is, is if land comes up alongside the stadium, you take it. Um, yeah. But it was even better that there happened to be an enormous warehouse on there that had both a short term or short to mid term use as, as a fan zone or, or, or that type of thing, pre-match uh, event zone or um, even a longer term view. So, uh, you know, that we could do something. You know, in, in 10 years time that might look slightly differently that would still be a great revenue earner for the club so it's a great opportunity and and you you know you can't lose because we're able to monetize it in the short term so for me it's a it's a massive game changer i think you know when you look at, uh, at finances in a football club you've kind of got two levels you've got your your traditional income lines so you've got your ticketing your sponsorship mm -hmm. your retail all those typical ones and and you obviously look to optimize all of those and that's Again, what we've been doing this year, we've, we're, we're sort of restructuring the hospitality, restructured all our sponsorship packages. We're looking at the, the retail, how we can improve margins there. So everything's been restructured on the traditional level. But then what we're looking to do is then go up to the next level, which is to put this layer of secondary income lines in that enables us to generate much more than most other clubs um, of a similar size because we're looking at things like you know, having an event space um, we're looking at things like we've got the paddle courts, we've got, you know, the education hub, you know, all of these things are all going to bring in incremental revenues um, into the club to, to help us grow and, and, and get to a point of sustainability. I, I think if you don't have those, it's quite tricky, you know, to get to that level of sustainability. So that secondary tier of income generating assets is, is really, really important. So, so in, in a nutshell, so, so the nest, you're hoping to have it open in the summer, possibly potentially for the Euros. So this yeah. will be, a, a, be, be an event space uh, as part of a match day experience for Knots fans. I, I would imagine you would then be looking to use that away fans going to Forest or how, however it was being structured. So this becomes a multi-use revenue earner for Correct. the club and you can have events, Absolutely. Christmas parties or whatever it is. Yeah. Beer, 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 event, you know, beer festivals, whatever you like, you know, live showing of, of, of other games or sports events like the darts, all sorts of things. And, you know, if you can imagine it, we can we can use it. We also set it up. You know, we've put in uh, the, a 
a broadband that will enable us to have uh, esports or e gaming events in there as well, which is obviously you know, enormous these days. Um, but likewise, it's also a venue that can be utilized by the community. So our foundation are going to look to utilize it in the day. So it becomes a really important community asset. Um, and it, it and obviously enhances everything for our fans, you know, particularly around around the match day. Um, so those sort of investments are are, are brilliant, you know, and, and and we're very lucky that that happened to be on our doorstep. Um, but you know, we jumped on it. We saw the opportunity. The owners absolutely saw the value in it, and, and I'm really happy to that we're in the position that we're in with it. Um, season ticket holders, uh, rec record numbers, six thousand. I'm guessing that the part of the challenge that the brothers has set you is to, by raising more money, is to move that needle closer to a break-even figure year on year mm -hmm. operationally. Um, how challenging is that? How achievable is, is that? I re did I read somewhere saying that you, the, the brothers potentially would only have to put in 50% as much this year in inverted commas to subsidise operations? Probably the wrong word, but um you, you said it was going very well to start of the season yeah certainly from a, from a pnl point of view absolutely yes uh, it would do not, not necessarily from the cash flow because obviously there's a lot of capital investment you know but when exactly. that's amortized over across the term then it's absolutely it is um so it's all speculating to accumulate at this stage yep. um but yeah that that that's effectively you know we have a plain budget at the moment and the idea is that you know obviously the the, the brothers are, are have to put in some of their own money for, for, you know, and did last year and, and have done this yeah. year but we've already reduced that this year and the idea is that that just gets smaller and smaller as, yeah. as we go along and I, I actually believe that certainly we'll be very close next year and, and the year after that I would expect us to be you know at a, a self-sustainable level um, okay you which, should, you know. yeah for, for the unwashed yeah. i.e me and some of our supporter mm -hmm. base uh what does that translate to you break even in terms of trading each year correct yeah so the, the, the brothers don't have to put in more money. The, 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 the club itself generates enough income to support the playing budget effectively. And on that, Joe, okay. I'm assuming that's not built in any assumptions over promotion or anything like that. That nope. is, as the club is, you know. No, that's, that's, that's pushing commercial opportunities really yeah. hard. It's as simple as which, that. It's, it's which hard I think work. for fans is going to be great to hear. Yeah, it's, it's really hard work and it puts you in a fantastic position because your foundation is so strong. And, and at that point, the brothers could they, they could choose to put a bit more in if they wanted to, but they don't have to because the model is is developed in a way that it's designed, like we said, that we can achieve you know a good level budget, um, but then the model overachieves uh, on, on that. So you know, putting us in positions where we you know a promotion is very achievable without having to put in lots of additional money and put put the club in debt, which we don't want to do. In, I, I look, and in, 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 it's interesting there. We talk about debt, and it's an interesting discussion, uh, Joe. So, sustainability. Um, you mm. know, for me, looking across most clubs, the definition of sustainability is the capability of the owner to fund the club as and when is required. And two, just as importantly, hence the earlier question to Richard, the willingness to want to do it. And mm. Notts County, uh, for the past 20 years since Derek Pavis left, he was a very successful owner of the football club, have by and large been beset by owners who uh, either have had the money for a bit, but then decided they don't want to put any more in because of personal abuse, because results aren't going well on the pitch, yeah. or others where the money has gone in, and this would be the case with Alan Hardy, his business has struggled, and then he hasn't got the money to keep propping the club up um now i do believe that this is the best the club has been in for, for a long long time with the brothers we spoke about legacy with richard uh, uh, yourself and richard earlier but kind of the fact remains when you look on you know and i speak to kieran Maguire, you know you look on the balance sheet the brothers since taking this football club over it's cost them in inverted commas albeit loans put onto the club 14 million quid mm -hmm. So that there's, there's kind of a dichotomy there, isn't there? Because well, ultimately really. I mean, we are still very dependent on the brothers. Yeah, there's there's a debt. I mean, they're obviously there to to pay off the debts to to acquire the company, um, and that was that was yep. you know a great thing for them to do. And but it was part and parcel of of, of taking it over. And and you know that what's important is that that debt doesn't keep growing. 
So again, and that's, that, that's, that's my point. Debt. Over the last two years, yeah. it's cost an average of two million a year, hasn't it? Broadly, yeah. four million over the last two years. It's it, what 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 fans should be concerned about is if that that debt then goes up to twenty and then twenty five and then thirty. That's when you become concerned. At fourteen, right. bearing in mind that okay. that that debt is a loan to the the owners themselves, but they may choose to capitalise yes. it, and, and it's no longer a debt. But it's it's healthy, you know. Not not all debt is bad, um, but the point is is that we don't want that to grow anymore um and we will stem the flow of that and that's that's effectively my strategy is 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 that we hopefully won't see on the balance sheet that 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 continues to grow and i think as well, ah, so that's, that's an interesting having a self-sustainable club at mm. any point in the future makes it a more saleable asset for any uh, new potential absolutely. owners should the brothers ever correct you know want, uh, want to want to go elsewhere you know it that's makes right. the club as an entity sustainable it's in itself Absolutely, and and that's the point is that you know if, if you get to the championship, then it's going to be worth a lot more than that fourteen million. Yeah. So you know, uh, from the owner's perspective, it's it's been a great investment. You know, so it, it, that that's the point. It's how you look at debt. But for, for me right now, is actually saying, no, we we we're going to stem that. We we want to get the club in a position that we believe this, a club of this size can generate. You know, we've we've modelled it on what we think it can achieve. And we, why, why wouldn't we try <laughs> want to generate as much as we can? All clubs should do. Yeah. Unfortunately, some yeah. clubs, are, you know, don't have that desire. They'd rather take a, a, a you know, a different, a different approach. It's a, it's the right thing to do in football. It's the right way to run a club. It's the right way to run a business. You know, most businesses <laughs> run from from trying to be as efficient as they can, um, and, and and managing their finances and generating as much as they can. In, in one of the statements that were made recently, Joe, um, you, you, it was alluded to about potential uh, more financial prudence, corporate governance, potential regulations coming in uh, from the EFL. Um, yeah. it, it, are you, is that an inference you're kind of expecting? I and mean, we all know the Premier League, you've got a few challenges with their model at the minute. Are you expecting some more formal... Um, um uh whatever the word is some, some formal so regulation or formal regulation yeah. yeah um yeah. it's difficult to say at the moment because we we still haven't had the deal from the premier league which is obviously very disappointing um so yeah. <laughs> at the moment it is you know things continue as they are um for the time being um but absolutely you know how that evolves with the football regulator um, we, we don't know. There was a period where we thought they weren't going to do particularly much, but it seems that the government has, has changed um, their stance on that and have, have been a little bit more aggressive, whether that's just to try and get the Premier League to, to actually come to an agreement on a deal. I, I don't know. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's the right thing to do. Clubs clubs should be more responsible. Why? why you know, you've just got to work a lot harder at it. Um, yes, it makes it more difficult for potentially smaller clubs to be able to achieve a lot more because you know they maybe don't have the scale um to be able to to self-sustain themselves at a level that you get to the championship um but that's sort of the natural order of football and, and actually if clubs want to get bit, bit bigger they have to work harder at drawing a bigger fan base building a bigger stadium investing in their infrastructure and that that's what good clubs should do um we'll wrap up with a few more sort of um just, just questions and subject matter for you, Joe. Um, season tickets. Uh, everyone's mm -hmm. eagerly awaiting. Anything you can share? Re-season tickets. Yeah, they. We we will be going on sale with those on the 29th of April. Okay. Um, anything more you can share at this stage or not? Clearly, your season ticket holder, I, I suspect, still yeah. remains <laughs> the single most important person or category. Absolutely. Of person to Absolutely. Afford. Look, we. Yeah. You know. Taking taking on board, you know, this this approach, and when I talk about sort of maximising those traditional lines, you know, we 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 are looking at prices. Obviously, we we have to. Um, I think everyone does. You know, it's it's important in in terms of being self self sufficient. But what we're saying is we're we're not looking to go crazy. We're not we don't we're not going to be the the most expensive in the league, but we're also not going to be the cheapest. I think what we've seen is it's really important for us to to have um, uh, prices that are at our level. 
um, and they certainly haven't been in the past. Certainly in, in hospitality, they've been probably the cheapest in, in the four divisions almost. Yes. Um, and that's yep. not something to be yep. proud about when we not really make any money on them. Um, that's the reality. So those that has to change. Um, and we are investing in that area and we're changing the, the, the packages and, and it will be a different space. Um, we want to create more of a VIP environment. Um, but we need to, you know, if we want to be competitive on the pitch, we have to be competitive off it. So our prices need to reflect that. And our pricing, you know, our, our proposed prices for hospitality will be in line with the average in, in, in League Two. Yes, it hasn't. It's been below it. Um, and likewise, our, our ticket pricing um, will probably be slightly above average, but certainly not the highest. Um, and certainly not anywhere near where our, our neighbours have been uh, uh, increasing their prices. So, um, yeah, I mean, if I if I was to put this out to you, I mean, do you think that we should raise um, season ticket prices or ticket prices? Me? Well, look, I, I'll yeah. always give you, you don't have to agree with me, I always give you a transparent view. Yeah, I, 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 I think they should go up. You know, we're offering yeah. a football league product now. Um, yeah. I can... Honestly, the, the the size of support that this club now has, uh, for me, is unbelievable. You know, initially, Alan Hardy did a good job of reinventing the club after Ray True. Uh, you clearly thought supporter base would take a hit in the National League. It didn't. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember Notts County in the top flight of English football. Uh, and albeit hooliganism blighted it in the 80s, you know, I'm, I'm going to watch Notts County play Everton in, in, in the equivalent of the Premier League. We 8,000 fans there playing Leicester, 9,000 fans. And it's a different era. It's a different time. I think it's phenomenal, the crowds. And yeah, I, I, I personally, I would have no problem with season ticket prices going up. But equally, I appreciate, you know, I've I've got a few more shekels in my pocket, not that many, than many people. But no, I, I and I, I think you mentioned your hospitality prices. I agree with you. I, I, I think they are, in, I was going to say cheap, incredibly good value. Incredibly good value. So anyway, <laughs> sounds like we're going to brace yeah, ourseles for a price no, rise. Listen, thing, I don't think it's, it's certainly not It's not a price rise that people should be concerned about. It's, it's no, it right. won't be fairly similar to, to last season's one. So generally not. Right. Another emotive subject. Right. Sorry for running over. Um, another emotive subject. Um, safe standing. Mm. And I know this is a bit of a subject close to your heart, Joe. Um, yeah. I've seen it in operation in Europe. I like it. Uh, I think there's certainly, uh, for the COP, uh, an opinion they would like to see it. W w what's the status on safe standing? Is that something on the agenda, on the horizon for knots? Yeah, it's it's absolutely something on the agenda. And I think when we sent around the survey, you know, earlier in the year, people probably figured something was uh, something was on the rise. So, um, yeah, and obviously that that came back with a you know an overwhelming um, support for safe standing, particularly in the COP area. Um, so certainly in the, the 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 medium term, that is our view is that we look we want to get to that point. It won't be for next season, um, but certainly the okay. possibly the year after that, it, it may well be. The other thing that's driving that is obviously the changes within um, uh, local local councils and, and the SG, SGSA in terms of um, what they want to see clubs doing in regards to persistent standing. Um, I think I sort of mentioned earlier is is it's a subject that has been quite irksome for me because obviously I've spent you know a good part of the year trying you know lobbying central government to get it get it installed at the Wimbledon Stadium and it took a lot of time and a lot of persuasion um eventually gave in to now be in a situation where some people are saying yeah no you, you have to put it in you have to put it in right now it's like well you know you, not all clubs are able to do that so it may be that we have to undertake a, a little pilot which we may well do we're still in discussions at the moment on that um so that may happen earlier um but at the moment we're, we're certainly not looking at a, a wholesale um, changes or, or installing safe standing for next season um, but certainly from the season afterwards uh, definitely yes um, Training ground um, Yep. you've unveiled some very ambitious infrastructure projects historically mm -hmm. the club has not owned its own training ground 
for a long, long, long period of time now, you know, and, and, and many of our fans have sort of said tonight, you know, can you ask Joe, uh, is there any plans for that? At the, mo at the moment, for several seasons, Knots have used um, uh, a training pitch uh, by the banks of the river, owned by Nottingham Forest. Mm. Um, are there any plans for a, tra you know, for, for a club-owned training ground infrastructure at some point? Obviously, we you know it's all part and parcel isn't it it's, it's one of the, the 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 big things is is having your own training ground and as you quite rightly say we we have it for ever uh, as far as i'm aware and we've been a bit nomadic obviously having been at home road and before that up in arnold and then at highfield so, you know we've been all over the place and it's not an ideal situation you know we're obviously at home road at the moment which is great um you know the players sort of come and they're based here in the stadium again that's not ideal you know ideally they should be in one uh, one site with the pitches and and the base um it's it's much a much better environment for them to be in and obviously i can get some more rooms back in the stadium which would be nice um so you know at the moment we, we we're looking at long term we're having some we've I've, I've met with all the councils I've, I've had a look at pretty much every single green space in the city now i think um and uh you know we, we have a view on some potential sites and potential opportunities for the long term um we're still um in negotiation with with uh forest over a, a new deal at home road but that may not materialize we may have we we're also looking at uh, talking to others and um you know we need to, to to make a decision that's best for us moving forward um but certainly in the long term yeah we we are looking at you know we, we would like to look at the opportunity to, to find our own training ground um I think we're about done. One final question for Richard, uh, who's very patiently been sat there. Um, one of the kind of theme, if you like, um, player pathway, academy through to first team. Uh, and obviously Notts have been challenged with at various points, academies shutting down uh, and obviously moving to the National League didn't help the situation. Um, how important, Richard, is it um, to the brothers for the dna of the club to you know establish a strong pathway for, for for players coming through the system to make first team appearances and and and, and in the not too distant future hopefully become first team regulars yeah i mean i think it's 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 double faceted because you have the 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 special feeling that you inevitably get when when you have one of your own players coming through and, and playing for the first team which is which is amazing really and and it obviously means so much to the to the community and the fan base as a whole i think that's one of the most special things that we have in football is when you have a 17 18 19 year old academy player coming on for a debut and and getting a pro deal and and like we've had this season with james sanderson um and obviously lucian now yeah. now pitching on and being on the bench last night and hopefully we'll, we'll get to see lucian in the last couple of games um i think that's really special and that that is a large amount of what football is about but then there's also the the, the other the other part of it which is the which is the financial element and which is the mm. the undeniable fact that if you have younger players who've come through your academy they're not going to be on the same sort of level of wages immediately as your your top earners so if you can get contributors uh in your squad who can who can play good minutes for you but are on lower salaries then then you're going to go some way to outperforming your playing budget which is the overall ambition that we speak about so i think it it works from both perspectives as you as you allude to we needed to we when we lost the academy funding we needed to sort of strongly consider what we what we wanted to have as an academy and i think the the the, the real key point was that um it meant a lot to the fans and it, and it means a lot to the football club to have an academy so thankfully chris and alex were able to support us in in maintaining sort of a, a loose category three structure yep. in the national league that thankfully has enabled us to 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 go straight back up to category three in the efl which i think really is is unheard of for teams coming out of the national league after it three is. years like we did so i mean that's that's dan levers and, and his team they've done an unbelievable job um we also need to be patient because part of part of going down to that level means you lose your protections over your young players so i think i've spoken about this before but it's this crazy injustice that because you become a national league team you immediately can be raided of of your best 
young prospects. So yeah. there are other clubs in the East Midlands who are maybe seeing the benefits of some of our younger players <laughs> now, um, yeah. which which hurts. Of course, it does. Um, but we believe that we're, we're putting the academy back in a place where it can start to hopefully contribute to our first team squad in years to come. So, yeah, it's, it's absolutely an important part of what we're doing. And we need to determine just how important it can be for us. I think that's an important part now. Right now, it's it's doing a great job of um, providing the occasional professional footballer for our first team squad. We need to decide how productive can that academy be? How far can we push it? Does it require extra investment? Can it? Can it? Is it best sustainable like it is? Um, those are all conversations that we'll be having Joe and, and and Dan at the academy in in the next couple of years. So, I think it's an exciting time for the academy. Definitely, I would hope to to start to see more more prospects from from that area in, in the coming seasons. Yeah, and finally, Joe, obviously you have experience of this from other clubs. I mean, y- your thoughts on development of academy. Uh, absolutely the same way i mean you know they are for some clubs they're an absolute lifeblood you know particularly clubs that don't have have bigger budgets you know they're really really important that you are developing your own players and, and that they then potentially provide you with even you know another contribution to your income model through you know selling them through to player transfers so it's it's really important and, and, and for us you know we're starting to get a handle on on what that might look for, for look like for the club, um, both from how that like those players contribute to the first team, um, but also you know if they're not contributing to the first team, do they contribute somewhere else? You know within the football pyramid, um, and and is there a value to them? So there's always a value, you know, to to developing academy players, whether that's like I said supporting yourselves um, in the first team or or supporting other clubs where you've received an income for that. So. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in in, in youth um, massively. I, I think some of the younger players, and I think you, Richard would agree that you know it's something that we're also looking at is, is is when we're recruiting is looking at younger players because there is more value in them. Um, certainly down the line, particularly after you've had them for a couple of years. Um, so, you know, it, it, I'm really excited about where they can go. I'm, I'm you know amazed by what Dan and his team have, have managed to achieve. Um, over the last couple of years in the National League and obviously just passed um, our Category 3 status um, in the EFL um, successfully this year. So, yeah, there's there's lots going on there. Um, and, uh, yeah, really excited to see where that, how that develops with more of those players coming through in the, in the coming seasons. I think as well, just the, the last living... point. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Paul. I was just going to say the last part on the academy no, as well. I think it, we have to... Um, we have to we have to work out what we can do differently to other people. So we're surrounded by massive clubs, really, um, who have Category 2 mm. and Category 1 academies. So if we do the same as everybody else, we'll just be swallowed up. And um, we can't we can't compete with their resource. We can't compete with uh, all of the things standards academy, academies are offering. We need to work out as an academy, and, and Dan and myself and Joe are talking about this all the time, what's our usp what can we do differently to the big fish around us at the moment that will allow us to to develop our own type of player or allow us to to have a niche within this this uber competitive field um because the academy system in this country is geared up for the big clubs to be successful so if our academy is to bear fruit we need to do things differently and and think creatively about how best to maximize the resource that we have and, and living proof of an academy. Well, I don't know if it's an academy system or not in your day, Stel. 16 years old, full debut at Derby County, yeah? Yes, a long time ago, yeah. It was School of Excellence back then. But but it's right. I mean, the pathway is the thing. The USP, whatever you want to call it, the best way of attracting young talent, and it's, there's numerous clubs that have done it, you know, over the years, is to see that there is a clear pathway for youngsters to get in in the first team. Mm. Obviously, yeah. they've got to be good enough. Obviously, they've got to have the talent, the ability, but there's no more incentive to to, to sign in the next wave of young, young talent than seeing we can name X, Y and Z players who've been in the first team, a James Sanderson, Lucian Mahovo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that goes on. And that then breeds into and built into that sustainability or safe sustainability of Notts County, which is what I think everybody wants. Yeah. Absolutely. Fan, fan hat again. Fan hat again. 
and I don't, I, I don't know if you can comment on this, Richard, but and, and Stell's mentioned this as well to me. It, it, I wonder why, when professional football clubs, including us, you can have five, six, seven subs, whatever it is, I lose track in different competitions, and we don't name all the subs. For me, is that not an opportunity missed? to put the young James Sanderson or whatever into a first team arena, just taste it, just be in the dressing room, run around on the pitch before the game. The reality is he's pretty sure he's not going to come on, but just for the sheer nerves and everything, fill, fill your number of subs out with a 15, 16, 17 year old. And it instantly, the lad's delighted. The parents are, his mates are, the other ones are. I always think it's a missed opportunity. I, I agree with clubs you. I agree with you, Paul. I just I, I don't know why you wouldn't do it. There, there is, there is an annoy. I think this will annoy you because it annoys me. <laughs> There's a safeguarding <laughs> issue around 15, 16, and 17 year olds, um, where the amount of red tape that you have to to wade through in order to to have a, a player younger than 18 on your bench is is actually it's a can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, but in in, yeah. in general terms yeah absolutely i think uh, joe will correct me if i'm wrong yeah. i think any under 18 year old needs a yeah. chaperone they need After a separate changing rooms they have to have all sorts yeah loads of loads of stuff like that which yeah uh, yeah make it your you own you for James no, i didn't Sanderson. get any of that when i was yeah. 16 at dark <laughs> 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 that explains a lot Sam. exactly yeah exactly <laughs> Well, it's, it's not right. general, so not when you had James Sanders, you had to do all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he was he he so, changed in his own dressing room, I think. Yeah. Um, and he had a chaperone from the academy with him all day. And uh yeah, it's 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 crazy. So so if you imagine if you want to take that player on the the of work and bureaucracy that goes into that. I didn't but in general that. terms, I completely agree you with you. Me? And it's going to be a big thing for us. And don't, don't be, yeah, you know, because, look, I mean, look, we've got to say it's it's not, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's there for the right reasons. Um, it just, yeah, it just puts, you know, other layers of regulation on. We just have to, <laughs> you know, it puts more more, more workload on, on the clubs. Um, but, you know, it, it's absolutely yeah. right that, that, that this is what has to happen. I'm going to get a letter from the EFL yeah, well, now. Ca can he hold chairman <laughs> that he was? <laughs> can he hold chairman that he was? Because Knotts do have a history of producing young players 20, 30 years ago before the advent of these academy systems. And we had a young J Jermaine Pennant came on when he was 15. And, and basically, Derek Pavis, shrewd cookie, kind of advised Sam to put him in the team make him the youngest ever player to play for Notts County, sling him on. Uh, and, you know, two months later, Arsenal end up paying a million quid for him. You know, and clearly that valuation can be skewed just a little bit by the fact they've put him in the first team and all of those sorts of things, you know. Um, but anyway, gentlemen, look, we've, we've, we've taken up far too much of your time this morning. Um, on behalf of myself, I'm sure Stel uh, and everyone yep. that listens to our show, thank you so much. Um, for giving us your time as we've said before no subject uh was off topic um we kind of asked to ask asked to ask direct questions and i think you've answered them extremely well joe richard um thank you very much indeed for everything that you're doing um i'll we'll, we'll let richard go back to signing a few players and uh joe raising even more money so the brothers don't have to keep <laughs> coughing up and putting us north of that 14 million mark much uh, gentlemen, th thank you ever so much. Hope you've enjoyed it, Richard, and a chance to sort of ha have a bit of a chat. No, it's been great. Thank you ever so much, guys. And uh, I, I really appreciate the, the questions. And, and it's been a really nice opportunity to, yeah, to, to speak more directly to the fans. So, yeah, yeah. thank you, guys. And Joe, and Joe, thank you for everything you're doing for the club. And, and it's great to have a chat. And you've clearly shed some light on some quite interesting issues. Uh, and uh, this this really is only the hors d'oeuvre, the starter, because I think you've got a um, uh, you've got like a fans forum at the end of the season, haven't you? So um, be, be yeah. ready for why why the why, why aren't we serving chips? Uh, <laughs> there's another <laughs> but you will get asked about chips and mushy peas once again, Listen, particularly as they I were served. Quite nice chips at Walsall on Saturday. No yeah, pressure. Enough. Yeah, no. Listen, look, we we you know I'm a big believer in being as transparent as possible, and and we want fans to understand the process. We want them to understand 
how the model works, why we're doing it, the long-term process, the more we can get this across, hopefully the more people, fans will, will, will feel, you know, much more positive and, and, and really on board with it because actually, you know, how much more exciting is it going to be to get promoted in a self-sustainable manner rather than spending five, five million quid and putting yourself in debt? It's, it's, you know, it's bragging rights, isn't it? Stel, illuminating. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, really, <laughs> really, really, really glad the guys have come on. I, I, I still think the balloons were the best part of it, not to, not to take anything <laughs> away from Joe and, and Richard. No but, idea. What is <laughs> I no idea. But no, yeah, thank you for your time, fellas. No, you're really busy. Cheers, Stel. Uh, no yeah, worries. Thank you. Thank ever you. so much. Um, it, we're using the Stockport referees uh, match watch. Uh, we're four minutes short of the 90, so we're blowing up early like he did at half time last night. Everyone, thank you very much. We've indeed. had the same amount of yeah, technical bye -bye. problems as well. <laughs> Not wrong. Shh. Hey, hey, Stel, you're being kicked out of your commentary box with all them new hospitality seats. Hey, have a word to go. I'm 50 this year. Yeah. I'm going to get my eyes tested anyway. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everyone, thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yes. Bye.